It's April 12th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories, making the headlines at this hour. Starting with the U.S.-Japan-Philippines summit in Washington, D.C. The three countries are holding their first ever summit in a bid to foster their defense and economic cooperation. There, U.S. President Joe Biden said his country's defense commitments to Japan and the Philippines remain ironclad in the face of regional security challenges. President Yoon Suk-yeol vowed to reform his conservative administration after the main opposition Democratic Party's landslide victory in Wednesday's general election. Most of the president's senior aides, including the prime minister, expressed their intent to resign. An international tribunal has ordered South Korea to pay 32 million U.S. dollars in compensation to U.S.-based hedge fund Mason Capital in an investor state suit the company filed over a controversial 2015 merger of two Samsung affiliates. The U.S. is hosting Japan and the Philippines in Washington to solidify their trilateral ties and explore ways to keep China in check. In fact, the three sides have just issued a joint statement expressing great concerns over China's aggression in the South China Sea. Our Choi Soo-hyung searches off. Today, uh, we mark a historic moment. The first ever leaders summit between the United States, Japan and the Philippines. And it's truly an honor to have you both here as we begin this new era of a partnership. The United States, Japan and the Philippines have held their first trilateral summit. On Thursday local time in Washington, D.C., U.S. President Joe Biden, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida and the President of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., agreed on cooperation for peace in the Indo-Pacific, including countering China. President Biden said the U.S. would active as mutual defense treaty with the Philippines if there is an attack in Philippines aircraft, ships or military forces in the South China Sea. This statement comes amid China's pressure over some of the islands under the Philippines' sovereignty in the region. Biden also mentioned promoting investment in facilities such as ports and railways connecting Manila and Subic Bay Port. It is a partnership born not out of convenience nor of expediency, but as a natural progression of a deepening relation and robust cooperation amongst our three countries, linked by a profound respect for democracy, good governance and the rule of law. The U.S. is building a new framework with key Asian allies to counter China. This includes forming a lattice-like network, which includes last year's trilateral summit between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan, known as the Camp Davis Summit, as well as the AUKUS, trilateral security partnership between the U.S., U.K. and Australia, and the Quad, which includes the U.S., Japan, Australia and India. Japanese Prime Minister Kishida said that Japan would actively support the U.S. I'm here to say that Japan is already standing shoulder to shoulder with the United States. You are not alone. We are with you. Also, new initiatives, countering China's Belt and Road Initiative, will be announced for joint investments in energy security, economy and maritime cooperation and other areas. Che Hyung, Arirang News. Again, this is the first time ever that the leaders of the three countries are putting their heads together and have arranged such a meeting. Let's discuss more with Chris Keskehill from Voice of America. Welcome back, Chris. Good to be with you. So how did the idea for this summit come out? Well, White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said in Tuesday's briefing that the seeds of this trilateral summit were planted in Tokyo last June when Sullivan met with his Filipino and Japanese counterparts. And they agreed to enhance the partnership. According to White House East Asia official Mira Rett Hooper, these three countries share a joint vision for the future of the region because they're all democracies. And the time was right for a leader-level leader summit, Dami. Right, then we have to talk about what roles Japan and the Philippines are expected to play here, especially for the Philippines, considering it's a new addition. Right. So first, let's talk about Japan. Japan has 50,000 U.S. troops stationed in its country, but command and control is in Hawaii. Now, the U.S. and Japan committed on Wednesday to better 
coordinate their military command and control with, control with some reforms. Um, the specifics of yet uh, have it to be announced. And the Philippines is also a key part of U.S. defense strategy in the region. There are no permanently stationed U.S. troops there, but the U.S. and the Philippines have a mutual defense treaty that dates back to 1951. Rather, mm -hmm. In 2023, they agreed upon four additional sites under the 2014 Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, or EDCA, to provide additional staging capacity for U.S. military, where U.S. troops rotate their presence no more than 10,000 at a given time. The Philippines also needs to retrofit its military assets. So to that end, the U.S. Senate has proposed $2.5 billion in grants over the next five years to help Manila purchase weapons from Washington. And this is all an effort to discourage China from its so-called gray zone tactics like firing water cannons, shining military-grade lasers at especially Filipino vessels in the last few weeks. Right, so it's highly likely that trilateral meeting will launch a new, or has launched a new security architecture, for, especially for the Indo-Pacific, uh, countering China and its growing aggression. Uh, that, what will that mean for South Korea and also for the Korean Peninsula? Well, Japanese PM Kishida said last week that he hopes it will be more unity in deterring China from resorting to military action to resolve its regional disputes. Japan and Washington have said this coordination is critical to guaranteeing a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now, there's also a role for Japan to play in meet, trying to meet with Kim Jong-un. Biden says Kishida's efforts in that regard are, quote, a good thing. And that's because Washington has not been able to open any lines of communication with Pyongyang. Definitely. And it was actually the first time that Biden showed a support for Japan's outreach to North Korea. Now, uh, Chris, I'm sure the trial out of summit on Thursday will get on China's nerves, right? Naturally, and it already has in anticipation of the bilateral meeting between the U.S. and Japan. The Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson said on Monday... We oppose cobbling together exclusive groupings and stoking block confrontation in the region. And the Chinese embassy in the U.S. told BOA over email they wanted to underscore that interstate cooperation should not target a third party. Such practices, patching up small blocks, stirring up confrontation under the excuse of co cooperation, upholding peace and order in name, but flexing military muscle and stoking chaos in nature do not meet the trend for peace and development and run counter to the regional countries' shared aspirations for stability and development. But National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan of the U.S. says that the President Biden has said that these alliances are not designed against any countries, but they are more in favor of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Right, and what China argues, and some analysts point out, is skepticism over whether this trilateral uh, effort between U.S., Japan, and the Philippines will actually, you know, stick and hold up. Is that likely to be so? Well, certainly the case is that people think that there might be uncertainty because leaders in the democratic countries will change going forward. Um, we know that President Biden's opponent in November, former President Donald Trump, has favored a bilateral rather than multilateral approach to his own foreign policy, and that was how he operated when he was in the White House several years ago. Now, the U.S. is not the only nation holding elections. Japan has them in September. And, of course, South Korean President Yoon suk yeol already has less political margin in your country since his party lost seats in this week's mm -hmm. parliamentary elections. And now for the Philippines... Ferdinand Marcos Jr. is limited to one six-year term that ends in June of 2028. That is right. All right, Chris, thank you so much for the report today. We appreciate it, as always. Good to be with you again. Following the general election result, President Yunsager said he humbly accepts the will of the people and promised changes to his conservative administration. Plus, most of the president's senior aides also expressed their will to step down. Our correspondent, Oh Seung, reports. 
Nearly all senior aides to President Yoon Seo-gyo have offered to resign along with the Prime Minister as the administration humbly accepts the results of the general election that dealt a crushing blow to the ruling party. Yoon's chief of staff, Lee Kwan Seo, briefed reporters Thursday morning, conveying the president's remarks that he will respect the will of the people expressed in Wednesday's election. He pledged to do his best to reform the running of state affairs and stabilize the economy and people's livelihoods. A senior official hinted that such a reform would first involve an all-out overhaul of Yoon's top aides. Most have expressed their intent to resign. The chief of staff, chief of staff for policy, and all senior secretaries, including those in charge of political affairs, the economy, and press relations. Prime Minister Han Dokso, who has been playing a leading role in domestic affairs, told the president he intends to step down. The inevitable list of figures resigning excludes those in the National Security Council as they deal with the nation's security and foreign policy strategy. With three years left in office, Yoon faces an uphill battle in pushing through major policy initiatives to reform labour, education and pensions, as well as cut tax and subsidise key industries such as semiconductors. Efforts to communicate and persuade the opposition and the larger public remain an ever vital task. When asked whether the top office would engage with the opposition to win their cooperation on bills related to the economy and people's livelihoods, the senior aide indicated that would be the case. The official added that the president has considered Wednesday's general election as the public's evaluation of his handling of state affairs and that the presidential office will reflect upon the outcome. Oh Siang, Arirang News. The Bank of Korea's Monetary Policy Committee is holding its third monetary policy meeting of the year at this hour to decide whether to adjust the base interest rate, which currently stands at 3.5 percent. Now, experts say the BOK is likely to freeze the base interest rates again, citing unstable prices. The consumer price index hovered above the 3% range for two consecutive months in February and March due to high agricultural and global oil prices. If the Monetary Policy Committee decides to keep the rates unchanged, it will mark the 10th consecutive rate freeze. An international tribunal has ordered the South Korean government to pay 32 million U.S. dollars in compensation to Mason Capital, a U.S.-based hedge fund. Now, the move comes amid an investor state suit the company filed over a controversial 2015 merger of two Samsung affiliates. Lee seung has more. Six years after the U.S.-based hedge fund Mason Capital filed an investor state suit against the South Korean government over a controversial 2015 merger of two Samsung affiliates, the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands on Thursday ordered South Korea to pay 32 million U.S. dollars in compensation. However, the ruling is just a fraction of the 200 million dollars the New York-based fund has demanded. In fact, despite including interest on delayed payments, it represents just 16 percent of what Mason Capital requested. In a 2015 merger of Samsung CNT and Jail Industries, a ratio of 0.35 Jail shares was offered for every one Samsung CNT share. The hedge fund held a 2.18 percent share in Samsung CNT at the time and strongly objected to the merger, arguing that it undervalued Samsung CNT shares. In 2018, Mason filed a lawsuit saying that the South Korean government had unfairly intervened in favor of the merger. The controversial merger has since been at the center of a huge corruption scandal that led to the imprisonment of Samsung heir Lee Jae-yong and the eventual ousting and conviction of former President Park Geun-hye. Mason cited the results of the special investigation into corruption in state affairs, saying that it was clear evidence that the Korean government violated procedures to promote the interests of Chairman Lee's family, calling it the largest political corruption scandal in Korean history. It added that the Park administration exerted excessive influence on the state-run National Pension Service, a major shareholder in Samsung CNT, to cast its vote in favor of the merger. However, the South Korean government argued that while it's true that the former president accepted a bribe and was impeached and imprisoned for it, the bribe was received after the merger, adding that the National Pension Service is an independent corporation that's not part of the Korean government. The latest ruling marks the second time the South Korean government has been ordered to pay compensation over the controversial 2015 merger, as the PCA ordered the government to pay $53.59 million plus interest to U.S.-based hedge fund Elliott Investment Management in June 2023. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News.
South Korea's auto exports for the first three months of this year rose to a new all-time high for the period, mainly thanks to the eco-friendly cars. Park Konu has the details. South Korea has recorded a record-breaking quarter one for automobile exports in terms of value. According to data released by the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy on Thursday, total exports came to 17.5 billion U.S. dollars, or nearly 24 trillion won, up 2.7 percent on year. The value of outbound shipments in March alone rebounded to just under $6.2 billion after a drop of $1.05 billion was recorded in February from the month before. The rise was mainly attributed to growth in hybrid vehicles. The value of hybrid car exports in March jumped 37 percent on year to a record high $0.85 billion. In terms of domestic sales of hybrid cars, more than 40,000 units were sold in March, an on-year increase of 23.6 percent, despite domestic sales of all vehicles falling by 12 percent last month. Sales of electric vehicles were also up by 15.5 percent on-year, with total domestic sales of so-called green cars up 18.6 percent last month. And 365,000 cars were produced in March, higher than 2023's monthly average of 354,000, but down 10 percent from the same month last year. The industry ministry said decreased production was due in part to fewer working days and construction at one of Kia's factories. The industry ministry also said it would work to ensure a robust performance for the auto industry in 2024 to mirror last year when outbound shipments worth nearly $71 billion were seen. Park Geun-hye, Arirang News. Good morning. I'm Kim si young and now we turn off to stories from around the world. We begin today in Ukraine, where a major power plant near Kyiv was destroyed by Russian airstrikes early on Thursday. The thermal power plant was among several energy facilities in various regions of Ukraine hit by missiles and drones. The destroyed Tripilia coal-fired thermal power plant operated by a domestic energy company, Centrenergo, was one of Ukraine's largest providers of electricity and heat. Centronergo chairman Andrei Hota said that the airstrikes destroyed 100 percent the transformer, the turbines, the generators, adding that the scale of destruction is terrifying. At least two more thermal power plants were reported to have suffered significant damage from the airstrikes. Ukraine's Air Force said that they took down 18 missiles and 39 drones out of 82 missiles and drones used by Russia in the attack. Russian President Vladimir Putin said on the same day that Russia was obliged to respond following Kyiv's attacks on Russia's infrastructure. A Vietnamese billionaire real estate tycoon was sentenced to death in Ho Chi Minh City on Thursday after being found guilty of fraud worth tens of billions of US dollars over an 11-year period. In what Vietnam state media is calling the country's largest financial fraud case ever, 67-year-old Tsung Mi Lan was accused of fraudulently acquiring $44 billion in loans for herself and her aides from the Saigon Commercial Bank. Thursday's verdict also requires her to return $27 billion. Her lawyers have 15 days to appeal the verdict. Ten state prosecutors and over six tons of evidence were used in the trial, while 2,700 witnesses were summoned to testify. Eighty-five others were on trial alongside Zhang Milan. All were found guilty with sentences ranging from suspended jail terms to life imprisonment. The former interpreter of Japanese baseball star Shohei Otani was charged with bank fraud on Thursday for stealing over $16 million from the Los Angeles Dodgers player. Ipe Mizuhara allegedly helped Otani to set up a bank account from which Mizuhara is accused of sending millions in funds to an illegal sports gambling operation. Bank fraud carries a maximum sentence of 30 years in federal prison. Previously, Otani told reporters at a press conference on March 25th that he had never bet on baseball or paid a bookmaker, saying that he was a victim of Mizuhara. Otani signed a contract, a $7 million 10-year contract with the Dodgers in the current season. 
However, federal investigators have reportedly not found any evidence of Mizuhara placing bets on baseball games. Former U.S. football star and actor O.J. Simpson, who was acquitted of the murder of his former wife in a 1995 trial, died at the age of 76 on Wednesday at his home in Las Vegas. One of the most popular American athletes in the 1960s and 70s, and nicknamed the Juice Simpson, was reportedly undergoing prostate cancer treatment. He began as a star running back at the University of Southern California and won the Heisman Trophy before being drafted as Buffalo Bills' number one draft pick. Simpson played 11 seasons of professional American football but became a controversial figure after he was charged with the stabbing deaths of his ex-wife and her friend in 1994. In 2008, he was sentenced to nine years in prison for armed robbery and kidnapping. Good morning. We are expecting an early taste of summer this weekend. By Sunday, Seoul will see a high of 28 degrees Celsius, but unlike southern provinces, will not be as hot as Seoul. Sunny skies in store for most places with warms, except on Jeju as rain is in the forecast on Sunday. Morning temperatures will also be warmer than norms, so beware of wide temperature gaps. Yesterday's sprinkle didn't help much to ease the dryness in the air. A dry advisory remains in place in the east of Seoul and Gyeonggi-do, so please stay alert against wildfires. Now the question is, along with the summer warmth, will there be an air quality issue? Other than Incheon and the south of Gyeonggi-do, the rest of the country will have decent air quality. Sunny skies expected for most places except on Jeju with a high of 21 degrees, while Seoul will be topping out at 24 degrees Celsius. This weekend's June warms will ease next week with nationwide rain in the forecast. Now that's Korea for you and here's a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching New Day at Arirang. We'll be back next Monday at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time. Completely new. something anyone can relate with. Lawlessly made. and tears that go with it. K-drama. Korea is coming at you with another story to tell. Wake up.
엄청난 에너지를 춤으로 뿜어내는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 엄청난 에너지를 춤으로 뿜어내는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 웰컴 24시간 불이 꺼지지 않는 나라 감당할 수 있겠니? 하나, 둘, 셋! 끝없이 쏟아지는 포터스파 휴대폰 한 대로 감당할 수 있겠니? 12th here in Seoul, I'm s i n y u n and you're watching News Generation. Joining me in the studio is Walter Lee. Lovely to be here. And Jen Kozak. Hello, good Happy morning. Happy morning. Now, both are here to speak on behalf of people in their 20s and 30s. As usual, let's start with our news feed, which covers different hashtags and news items that have been trending on social media over the past 24 hours. Our first story. Here in South Korea, one of the most popular chatting applications or mobile messenger apps is Kakaotalk. But a report on Tuesday showed that the number of people regularly using the app fell
itself the lowest in 22 months. As of March, there were 44.97 active users. This came down from 45.19 mil million in February. It's been a while since Kakao Talk relinquished its place as the most used mobile app. YouTube in December had more than 45 million users, and experts believe more people are now considering Kakao Talk to be a means of work-related communication. The uniform number 42 worn by Los Angeles Dodgers superstar Shohei Otani has been auctioned off at around $100,000. Otani wore this uniform on Jackie Robinson Day on April 16th, which is a big baseball event honoring MLB's first black player. On this day, all players are allowed to wear number 42 uniforms. Otani's uniform in particular, though, is considered a limited edition due to its scarcity. And staying on sports, French athlete Anno Garnier broke the rope climbing world record on Wednesday morning after climbing 100 meters above the second floor of the Eiffel Tower. The 34-year-old and two-time obstacle course world champion shopped on lookers in front of Paris's most iconic landmark. Her main objective was to beat South African Thomas Van Tonder's record of ascending 90 meters for the men's record. She also smashed the previous woman's record set by Dane Ida Mathilde Stainsgard, who peaked at 26 meters. After just 18 minutes of climbing, Garnier hit 100 meters, and she told AFP that it was a dream come true. Now, here in the studio, I'd like to ask our panelists what they thought about this news story, and how do you feel whenever you see or hear about stories where athletes break their own record or world records? Well, I think it's incredible because, you know, we think we know the limits of the human body and what the human body can do but then people continue to break records on and on so I think it's we're learning more about how much we can actually handle so I thought I saw this video and it's incredible I would be way too afraid to do such a thing exactly and what was more interesting was that she was climbing up the Eiffel Tower the Eiffel Tower the my goodness side of Paris <laughs> so that was interesting to see as well what about you Walter well first of all I think it's a great achievement for a female in this mm. situation because not only did she break the female record she also break the male record, which is very rare to see uh, any woman do because obviously the difference in strength. And so it was really great to see her being able to break that record and she could obviously go on further in the future. You know, when I was young, the Guinness Book World Record book was one of my favorite books to read because I'd love to see what people could achieve and I was always wanting to be in the book. I don't know what I would do exactly because I don't have any talent or any <laughs> patience to break records. But but that's a, that's a cool title to ho hold is that you have a Guinness World Record in something. So Amazing. there's no, you know, never say never. I could, you know, be some sort of record one day. But yeah, <laughs> maybe your record could be the one who read the <laughs> Guinness World Book for the longest time or something. That's yeah, 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 yeah. Record. Maybe the who biggest fan of the, the Guinness, the Guinness, the Guinness fan of the World record. record Book. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> Don't give up. Yeah. Now switching gears to our main discussion topic of the day now. Have you seen Cardi B's latest product noodles mukbang video, the high-profile female rapper from the States posted a video on her TikTok channel trying out the spicy instant noodle snack, which attracted over 20 million views. And it's not the first time she posted videos of her trying Korean food. Now here at the studio, did you guys see any of her videos and did you try any of the food, including the product snack that she's tried in her TikTok video? I think we know the answer to whether I've tried the bulldog kumyon or the bulldog noodles yes. uh, before. If, if you watch the show, you've seen numerous times I've put my life on the line for this program <laughs> and uh, it has been not f exactly fun. <laughs> the carbonara is supposed to be uh, a little less spicy, but that's not true at all because I've tasted that and it is still just as spicy. And as we've seen, I'm not really the best with spicy food, and, but I, I enjoy the little bit of spice, but the, this is way too much. Um, I've even bought the sauce and tried that, and that, oh, look, there I am. There you are. There you are, <laughs> just eating that, just thinking that, you know, it's not too bad. It's it's fine, and then as I progressively you know go up the scale of spice, I realize what a silly idea this was. But what I do for entertainment for this program. But as for Cardi B, what is a Cardi B? Um, no, just joking. I know who Cardi B is. I'm not that unhip yet for the show. Uh, I am the oldest though. I did watch it last night, just just for the show, where she got her hands on some quote. Uh, I'll do my best Cardi B voice. Bulldak noodles. <laughs> Um, I'm actually more familiar with the TikTok creator she did it with, but yes, uh, it was interesting to see her uh, go th uh, eat the spicy noodles. Well, thank you for your impersonation of Cardi B, by the way. Yeah, it was the best one. <laughs> but it was really interesting to see that 
such a mega star in the United States, like a female rapper like Cardi B, high profile, try out a very familiar dish to me, which is Purdok, because I personally, that's my personal soul food. Oh, really? <laughs> Whenever yeah. I feel down, I have to have my Purdok because it really relieves my stress. But what about you, Jem? Have you ever tried Purdok noodles that Cardi B's tried out as well? I have not, but you're convincing me it's right really now nice. that uh, I think I should try it. And I think if I do try it, I would do it the same way that Cardi B did mm -hmm. in the video, right? She tried the carbonara, burdak bokumyan with a little bit of cheese, a little bit of milk, something to cool it down. Mm -hmm. I, I think I would. But uh, searching through her videos, actually, this was not the first Korean food that she tried. She also had bungopang, so like the fish bread, tteokbokki, chicken feet. Do you know sotok sotok, the yeah. little <laughs> sausage and rice cake on a stick? I love that one. That is also uh, one of my favorite foods. But of course, tteokbokki is my soul food. I love tteokbokki so much. As you can see here, I make it at home, I buy it instant, eat it with my kids. Um, every flavor of the tteokbokki rainbow, the rice cake rainbow, is my favorite. So yes, absolutely. <laughs> I can see, and as we're seeing on the screen, that's tteokbokki, spicy rice cakes in Korea. They're a popular junk food slash instant food nowadays. We're seeing it at convenience stores as well. And along with the K-Wave or Hallyu, Korean food has been gaining popularity globally. But it's not just fancy traditional dishes or cake cuisine like prugogi, like meat or beef. Nowadays, we're seeing more people wanting to try out Korean style instant food, which is why on Cardi B's videos, we didn't see the traditional Korean dishes that we are used to. We saw more instant food that's easily at reach at convenience stores. And which menus in particular do you guys think is booming in popularity these days? Well, according to a broadcast on CNN the, in the US, kimchi dumplings or kimchi mandu is uh, one of the things that was recognized as one of the uh, best dumplings in the world. And I mean, we're up against some stiff competition I mean, you think about Japanese or think about Chinese or Hong Kong dumplings. They are w well, like, known across the world, but they were actually, Korea basically took the cake, well, cake, well, take, took the crown, should I say, in this situation <laughs> um, when it came, comes to dumplings. And I absolutely love Korean dumplings. I eat them quite often. We have about four or five different flavored bags in our, uh, in our freezer at the moment because my wife also enjoys it. But yes, Korean dumplings have been gaining attention all over the US food market lately. In particular, uh, Korean dumplings have emerged as a large popular item in a retail chain known as Costco. Mm -hmm. And we've also covered on the show previously as well that frozen kimbap, uh, which is kind of like the uh, the rice roll, uh, yeah, that's also making it into U.S. markets as well. So it's great to see. Right, as you mentioned, K dumplings, though, they're a little different from other cuisines around the world. For instance, Japanese style kyoza or uh, Central Asian mandus as well, dumplings. But Korean dumplings in general are garnering much attention in the States for being frozen too, just like frozen kimbap. Though usually we would just make it at home and eat it instantly nowadays we're we're seeing a lot of frozen products of these two items which is why people can conveniently try them out whenever they want to now jem would you like to add on as to how popular korean instant food seems to be these days and which menus in particular are garnering much attention yes well actually it's very funny you mentioned the frozen kimbap a friend mm -hmm. just sent me a photo this morning of frozen kimbap i thought wow what a concept but of course just like with cardi b's video really uh, according to the american food magazine Bon Appetit, there was a global ramen ranking mm. uh, competition and actually Burdak Bokumyeon or the spicy noodles were ranked number two. Not just the original flavor but the hek or so-called nuclear version, mm -hmm. meaning the even spicier version is so popular and I can absolutely understand why because you know, so many people love a food challenge, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of Korean products have very interesting flavors. They expand on flavors. And actually, when I visit my home in the US, you know, these noodles, burdak noodles, are one of the most popular gifts that I bring. Things like burdak noodles, also my friends love yakwa, mm. right, like a traditional cookie, and also dargona, thanks to the series Squid Game, is still very familiar. So they love when I bring dargona, the noodles, and also yakwa. And apart mm -hmm. from that, I think 
I don't know about you guys, but whenever I go to Japan, personally for me, instead of going to all the fancy restaurants, what I do is I always go to the convenience stores. I love oh, it. Convenience stores are the best. <laughs> exactly, and that's how I think. It's a barometer of how popular that country's cuisine is because I know that sushi tastes good and amazing, but if I go to their convenience store, I can try out their instant food and junk food, and I think Korean food is getting that much attention these days. A mm -hmm. lot of my international friends come to Korea and with me, they go to the convenience stores, and we try out all these different types of combinations of instant food, especially since a lot of K-pop stars share their own recipes as to making yes. really good convenient food or junk food. Now, would you like to add on as to any more types of junk food or instant food in Korea that seems to be popular? Well, I know that obviously with Parasite, the movie Parasite, there was the... Japaguri? Yeah, Japaguri. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <Japaguri. laughs> yes. That was made very popular as well. But if you watch any Korean TV show, especially if it's related to food, there are many sections that go into convenience stores and they show you just how they mix it up a little bit or whether they have like a sandwich and mix it in with uh, something else or certain uh, ramen and then they mix mm. certain hot sauce with it. Mm -hmm. There's so many different combinations. Not too long ago there was uh, a big spike in Korean sauces as uh, we actually covered on this show and we are putting sauces on just about everything these days as well. For me I love going to the convenience stores and checking out all the junk food where I can't eat though I can just gaze at it from afar and pretend <laughs> to eat it because I know I, I, I just can't stop. It's like Pringles. Once you pop you can't stop. Which, <laughs> by the way, Korea has their own great style of Pringles these days. I'm, I'm watching do. a lot of these yeah, uh, on TikTok actually. Korean barbecue flavor Korean barbecue is flavor. actually one of the flavors that exactly. I have seen for Pringles. So. We're seeing traditional palates come into even our junk food. Right. And speaking of traditional snacks too, we mentioned, I think Jem, you were on that show as well, that a lot of Korean traditional style street food is also garnering much attention. So mm -hmm. it's not just K-food in general. We're seeing Korean instant snacks, street food, junk food, everything grow in popularity. And we asked our viewers if they have a specific Korean instant snack that they want to try out. If you take a look at the screen you can find out what three of them had to share with us let's start with benny benny said for me i'd like to try rose tteokbokki that's in a cup and then korean porridge my reason curiosity would strike if you really like these types of instant foods that fit your taste buds daru said pungopbang because i never had a chance due to the busy schedule when i visited korea last year and for our viewers who don't know pungopbang is a street food where it looks like a fish but there's custard and red bean paste inside leon said i would like to try the instant spicy jajangmyeon noodles or black bean noodles as it's a twist on the classic Korean black bean noodles, and it incorporates the popular Pruda, very chicken flavor for a spicy kick. I think it will enjoy the combination of sweet and spicy flavors. And we can confidently say that the Korean palate is becoming quite global, which is why chefs around the world are analyzing the spices and ingredients used in Korean food for their own recipes. That's why we're now going to include an international chef who has been doing that for years now. Stay tuned for our live interview. We're now going to turn to a chef and organic farmer from the States who has lived in Suwon City in South Korea for 17 years now. It's Chef Ryan Phillips. Welcome, Ryan. Hey, how are you guys doing today? All right, great to have you here, Ryan. And throughout the whole episode, we've been talking about the Korean food craze. And would you agree that Korean instant food in particular, like Purdak noodles, frozen kimchi mandu, and kimbap is getting global attention? And when did you know for sure that Korean instant food is becoming popular around the world? Oh, it's got to be the online presence that mm -hmm. uh, that made it so apparent. That and, and I go back and spend time with friends and family every year for at least a month. And, and I've just seen it more and more. I'll carry things back with me in my luggage. And then I get to Dallas, Texas, and at an Asian market, they've got all of them already there. And I'm like, <laughs> why did I carry this? Over? So why do you think it's so popular around the world? Well, of course, it's driven by by celebrities, by by the music, um, just just the wave that we've been talking about for 17 years. But it seems to be really happening more in the last couple of years. 
uh, in, in my opinion. Great. As a chef in Korea, how are you trying to jump on to this trend? How should Korean food better accommodate the palates of foreigners? Yes, what kind of things are you doing to make this happen? Well, I don't know if I'm, I'm trying to jump on any trends. I'm, I'm more of the farmer chef. You know, I'm, I'm usually <laughs> going back to the backwards rather than trying to, trying to make the next big thing. I do have a couple of ideas. Um, I, I've got an idea of kind of a, a fried bread with using a little bit of rice flour for that chewiness, but then a different kind of filling. I know you've seen things kind of like this. If somebody's willing to pay me enough, I will sell them this idea <laughs> and they can be that guy. I don't want to be the fried bread guy. Um, I'd much rather be the organic farmer chef guy. And as an organic yeah. farmer chef, what do you think about more foreigners turning to the instant flavors of Korean instant food then? Let, let me start by saying I have had buldak bokumyeon yeah. and <laughs> it is intensely amazing, satisfying, delicious. <laughs> um, I, I think any of you guys that have tried it, if you can handle the spice, and I love spicy, um, uh, it, it, I've, I've taken it back and shared it with friends and family back in the States. And even though it's a little hotter than most of them are used to, they love it as well. It's just, I mean, it's packed with, with MSG. I mean, it's going to make you feel <laughs> great and make you love it. I mean, uh, I don't judge chefs that use uh, those kind of ingredients or, or go to instant stuff at all. It's not my forte, but trust me, I've been on a bender for days before, uh, multiple times with those instant uh, foods because they are just so satisfying. They are, and I'm one of the many people who can't <laughs> seem to be hooked off of it. But I do have to say that there's so many other organic tastes in the Korean dishes that we're trying out right now. And as a chef that's been living here for so long, if your friends or family come to Korea, are there traditional tastes that you would like to promote here in Korea? Oh, you bet. There's so many things. I mean, the marinated crab, for starters, that's something that people have no... Kanjang Kejang, that's something that people around the world really haven't even heard anything about. And it's just such an amazing Korean food. And it, it and although it sounds strange to a foreigner, possibly, once they taste it, I think they'd fall in love with it. They will, they will. Thank you so much, Chef Ryan. It was a pleasure talking to you today. My pleasure. Y'all have a good day. Thanks, All Ryan. right. Thank you. And we've mentioned numerous times that Korean food is booming in popularity around the world, but today we dedicated our episode in focusing on Korean instant food trends. Now, hopefully, I would like to see this trend continue to boom, but at the same time, as the chef mentioned, there is a lot of MSG there, <laughs> not the most healthy options. I mean, it's worth trying once in a while. But regardless of that, how would you guys like to see this booming Korean instant food trend go on from now? Obviously, uh, K-food is the bomb. I love yeah. it. And it's. Uh, I remember growing up, in like Australia and actually Asian food was mainly represented by Chinese food. Yeah. Now it's great to see that Korean food is now almost overtaking Chinese food in the way of uh, Asian style food uh, or Oriental style food anyway. I really hope, and they kind of do it here in Korea sometimes, uh, that they do things like jokba, which is like pig's trotters in frozen form and they can send it out because uh, that's a food that I absolutely love. And when I go to Australia, I mean, they're not really used to pig's trotters. I know that in European countries it's very quite common, mm. but in Australian countries, I don't know about America, but that pig's trotter is not a common thing to eat. And like uh, the question that you asked chef before, like what would I recommend for my friends to mm. come? That's one of them, but they can't get their head past the fact that it's a foot. Yeah. And, <laughs> and for some reason, I'm like, you're okay with eating every other part of the body of the pig, but what, but what about, about the, the feet? Foot? Yeah. A delicious foot. A yeah. delicious, delicious foot. foot. Yeah. And like sometimes when I introduce like uh, one of my favorite foods is sundae gukbap, like I tell oh, them, oh, by yes. the way, this is made from like a blood sausage and it's also got yeah. pig's face parts in it. It just turns them straight <laughs> off, but they, people out there who haven't been to Korea, you have to be more adventurous. You have to be, you know, willing to go the extra mile and push 
the limits of your taste buds uh, because Korean food is amazing. And you've already tried that if you jumped on the Purdak noodle challenge trend as well. You've <laughs> already tried pushing your palate to see how much you can attest your spiciness level. And I completely agree. Once you come to Korea, there's so many different food options out there. And hopefully today's episode gave you a few ideas on what to try next. What about you, Jen? What would you like to see this trend go forth? Well, yeah, I totally agree that K food is the best. Uh -huh. I mean, the best. Maybe I'm biased, but I love <laughs> Korean food. However, I would love to see more traditional mm. kind of flavors. Um, if you've ever had bingsu, ice flakes with injormi powder. Yes. Mm. And I try to tell my friends, oh, well, it's a kind of sweet soybean powder. And when you say it in English, like, it doesn't really sound yeah. that delicious, right? right? I'm like, believe me, just try it. It's things like uh, soybean powder, the injormi, also black sesame. Yes. So maybe you've seen black sesame lattes or injormi lattes, as well as something like sweet potato. Mm. Even in the right. USA, um, it's not specifically a Korean flavor, but it is very trendy here in the winter. And I started eating sweet potatoes since I, I lived in Korea. So to me, it feels like part of the culture, part exactly. of the food palette. Yes, a necessity, actually. So I would love to introduce those kinds of things. And looking back to our viewers' comments as well, they said they want to try rosé tteokbokki. So we're seeing a lot of fusion happen here in Korea as well. And as you mentioned, Jem, sweet potato lattes yeah. or injermi latte. We're seeing so many different traditional ingredients and spices being mixed with modern food these days. So there's just a plethora of different options out there for you guys to try out once you're here. And then once again, hopefully today's episode really shed light to the different options you have. Now, in the meantime, we'll be here every day from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Korea time, bringing you more topics young people are talking about. Special thanks to Walter Lee. Lovely to be here. And Jen Kozak. Thank you. All right. And thank you everyone for watching. We'll see you next week. We are News Generation. Generation.